Good evening. This is The Big Story and we'll have all the highlights from the last day of campaigning for GE 2020. Hello, I'm Olivia Kuei. And I'm Dylan Ang. Subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. As the hustings wind down, candidates, including Deputy Prime Minister Heng Swee Kiet, were out this morning making one final pitch to voters. If you recall DPM Heng's last-minute addition to the People's Action Party's East Coast slate was the biggest surprise on nomination day. Ahead of his team's online rally tonight, Mr Heng said residents are enthusiastic and excited about the proposed East Coast plan. Speaking at Badok South Market and Food Centre, he said though that their concerns remain on the larger picture, like how they can keep their jobs amid the COVID-19 crisis. From his walkabouts, Mr Heng said that residents have told him that they want to be prepared for the changes ahead, referring to how COVID-19 will change Singapore's economic and social structure. Meanwhile, the Workers' Party's Aljunit team was canvassing in the market at Haugang Avenue 1 as well as in Haugang Mall. They were joined by party stalwart Mr Lau Tia Kiang. He posed for pictures and signed a resident's Workers' Party's umbrella. The resident, Eugene Chiu, has been collecting Mr Lau's signatures since the 2011 election. While most candidates concentrated efforts in their own constituencies, the entire Singapore Democratic Party team, all 11 of them, went on a mega walkabout. Chartering a bus, they walked in the five constituencies they're contesting. SDP Chairman Dr Paul Tambaya called its campaign outstanding, even as it's been forced to operate under unusual circumstances. He said the team did well to put up online rallies and Ask Me Anything sessions to reach out to voters. Okay, it's the final day of campaigning, so let's get foreign editor Jeremy Aoyong to weigh in. He's one of the editors spearheading our GE coverage. Let's recap first, Jeremy. What were the main messages from the nine days of campaigning? Well, Olivia, it's been quite a hectic nine days. It really felt longer than that for <laughs> me. Uh, so there were a lot of messages, a lot of themes that were brought up. I think I'm just going to... I'll just try and pick three. I, the first one I would go with, I think, is COVID. Um, we knew before coming into this election that this election campaign that COVID-19 was going to be key and uh, I think we saw it brought up um, two aspects of it. Firstly, um, in terms of policies and what we're going to do to uh, handle the COVID-19 crisis. We saw from the PAP, it's uh, laid out its plans for what, how they're going to deal with the crisis, their policies, their emphasis on jobs. We saw a lot of that from the PAP. Some opposition parties also presented some plans, but I, I, I guess there wasn't a lot of uh, to and fro on this particular aspect of the, of the uh, crisis. Well, we saw a lot more engagement between the uh, opposition and PAP on, as in terms of COVID, was on the politics of it and uh, what sort of politics would be the best way to deal with the crisis after the election. Mm. So we heard from uh, PM Lee the need for a strong mandate. He made the case for a strong mandate to deal with the crisis, not just for uh, unity of purpose at home, but also to, to preserve Singapore's standing in the world. Uh, from the opposition parties, their stand was that checks and balances were more important and that they were pointing to examples of other countries in the world where there was strong opposition presence. Uh, there was strong opposition presence in parliament, and still uh, they did cope with the COVID-19 crisis reasonably well. So that's the first one. Um, the the second key theme, I did allude to it a little bit, is uh, checks and balances. This has been a per perennial theme for the opposition party, and it really, again, was one of the key focuses uh, this time around across all opposition parties. I think the, if you, uh, for me, I, I think I heard the word blank check, super majority. <laughs> um, uh, me, nearly every day of this past campaign. So, uh, and that seems to be a, a real uh, point that the opposition is trying to hammer home. The uh, WP slogan for this rally, make your vote count, also was focused very heavily on the need for uh, checks and balances in checks and balances in Parliament, even uh, during a COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. 
The third one, if I were to boil it down, I guess it would come down to values. We saw a lot of disputes in, in this uh, campaign, people disagreeing on uh, all kinds of things. And uh, the 10 million population claim from the SDP, for instance, the PAP called that false. Um, there were disagreements about uh, this Sengkang candidate of the WP. But underpinning all of that, I thought it was a question of values, as in what sort of values do we want from the party or from an MP in Parliament. This was something that, that a, a conversation that seemed to start even before nomination day and just carry it through. Now, Jeremy, speaking of COVID-19, you know, we know campaigning efforts in this GE have been vastly different from uh, past elections due to restrictions on social interaction. Uh, how do you think the parties fared? I, well, not bad uh, as a whole. I think there really there was a lot of effort and uh, experimentation across the parties to try and put out content online. And we saw them experiment through uh, with a wide range of different formats. There were like live panel discussions where people took questions through the internet. Mm. There were pre-recorded talk shows that were slickly produced. Some were for a, looked like a TED talk or a lecture. Mm. And then there was, you know, some that were just live streaming their Zoom. So there was all kinds of, all kinds of things tried. Uh, like. Not bad as a whole, perhaps a little bit uneven between the different parties. That said, I do not know how effective all of it will uh, turn out to be. Hmm. Um, and it's going to be difficult to tell. So, uh, so uh, the offline campaigning did still seem to be a quite a large part of this campaign. I mean, there was a lot of emphasis online, but offline still, still seemed to be a significant part of it. Right. In part, I think the problem with the online campaigning is uh, not just the reach for uh, the difficulty reaching those that are not that comfortable online, but also the sheer quantity of stuff that ultimately got put out. Mm -hmm. There were so many videos, so many e-rallies that were put out there, and it was competing with the uh, daily constituency political broadcast we saw on TV. Um, for voters, it wasn't that easy to try and figure out what you know, what they wanted to watch on any given day and what was the key message for, for any of these. Right. Well, on the subject of, you know, the, the parties using uh, more of, an, uh, of their online platforms, how has it affected how the Straits Times journalists uh, reported their stories? Yeah, so I think the, the key difference really was, comes down to that quantity again. In uh, elections past, any given day, there would be, say, four or five major rallies. And each major rally would have a party leader, a minister helming it. And that gave each day a focal point for each party. For, for, for a journalist, you would pay attention to those four or five key events, and that likely would, would give you the key message on any given day. Mm. This time around, there were, there were dozens of videos on any given day. Some are rally, some are pre-recorded videos. And not all of it had, had the party leader in it. Some were just candidates. Mm. So you didn't know all. And, and so the, the themes were not consistent throughout every video that a party would put out. So it's not always that easy. We had to take a step back and gather it all up, reflect on what, what the real message the party was trying to put out, just given the sheer quantity of it. Uh, so I think that, that for, for the media side of it was uh, probably our biggest challenge. Hmm. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Jeremy. It's always a pleasure to have you on. That was foreign editor Jeremy Ao Yong, who's part of the GE 2020 team here at The Straits Times. Moving on, in a world dominated by the COVID-19 crisis, one thing is clear, the next 6 to 12 months will continue to be very difficult for many Singaporeans. Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh giving a blunt assessment at a PAP news conference today. We are under no illusion of the difficulties that lies ahead of us. So that's why this election is so critical for us. It is a chance for us to pull everyone together and move in the same direction, knowing that times are tough, but knowing that we can all work together to take care of one another. And for this election, the ultimate test for any candidate and any political party will be as follows. Who has the ability to help us secure jobs? 
who has the ability to help us secure investments and create opportunities for Singaporeans, and who is able to help organise our networks to help our workers and families that will be, may, may come under stress in the coming months. When it comes to trade and investment, Mr Chan highlighted two key points to help Singapore overcome the crisis. First, work with like-minded partners to continue to uphold bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements. And second, demonstrate to the world that the country can have consistent and coherent long-term policies. Also speaking at a news conference today was Social and Family Development Minister Desmond Lee. He said it's extremely important to uplift and support Singaporeans through this crisis. Uh, we see emotional and psychological stresses and strains uh, coming to the fore, largely brought about either by the circuit breaker, where people are forced into close quarters with each other, or as a result of uh, a financial and job-related stresses. And of course, social and family tensions. Uh, we have to address all of these and make sure that uh, uh, we can pull Singaporeans through and ensure that we remain resilient uh, through this period. Are you still confused as to how voting will work in a COVID-19 situation? Well, here's a handy visual explainer to help you understand the precautions you'll see at the polling centres come polling day on Friday. Before you leave the house, look for the recommended two-hour time slot on your polling card. It's also a good idea to check the queue situation at your polling station at votequeue.goware.gov.sg. On arrival at the polling station, your temperature will be taken. Anyone with a temperature of above 37.5 degrees Celsius will be refused entry. Once you're inside, stand one metre apart from others at all times. When it's your turn, you'll be asked to show your NRIC and lower your mask for verification. And scan your NRIC to register electronically. Next, sanitize your hands and put on a pair of disposable gloves before receiving a ballot paper. Use the self-inking pen provided or bring your own pen to mark the ballot paper. Voting booths and pens are sanitized regularly. After you've cast your ballot, throw the used gloves into a bin and sanitize your hands before leaving the polling station. Here's an update on the COVID-19 situation in Singapore. The Health Ministry confirmed 158 new patients today. They include nine community cases comprising four Singaporeans or permanent residents and five work pass holders. There are also three imported cases and all have been placed on stay-home notice since arriving in Singapore. More details will be announced later tonight. 100 nurses were presented with the yearly Nurses Merit Award by the Ministry of Health today. The award is given to nurses who have displayed noteworthy and exceptional performance who have contributed to the nursing profession. The nurses come from a variety of care settings from the community care, private and public institutions. Each award comes with a medal to be worn as part of the nurses' uniform and a cash prize of $1,000. The domestic helper who allegedly killed an elderly woman earlier this week has been charged with murder. 34-year-old Myanmar national Sanda Tu is accused of killing 95-year-old Madam Ang Pek Chai in her recreation home in her recreation road home near Upper Serangoon Road on Monday. The case has been adjourned to July 15th. Offenders convicted of murder face the death penalty. COE prices finished higher across the board at the tender today, the first since March. Premiums for Category A cars closed at $33,520, up by around $2,300 from the previous price. 
This before bidding was suspended for three months because of circuit breaker measures. COE for Category B cars ended at just under $35,900, an increase of some $5,800. Open COE, which can be used for any vehicle type except motorcycles, but ends up almost exclusively for bigger cars, close at around $35,000, up by about $2,500. Let's take a quick look at the global headlines. FBI Director Christopher Wray said the Chinese government is targeting hundreds of political rivals and dissidents who live in the U.S., including American citizens and green card holders. This in a bid to force them to return to China. Mr. Wray also said China is currently working to compromise American healthcare organizations, pharmaceutical companies and academic institutions conducting essential COVID-19 research. In the speech to a conservative think tank in Washington, Mr. Ray called China, quote, a threat to our economic security and by extension to our national security. According to him, almost half of the FBI's 5,000 active counterintelligence cases are related to China, and it opens a new China-related counterintelligence case about every 10 hours. Australia's second biggest city has seen supermarket shelves stripped as millions in Melbourne prepared for a return to lockdown. Five million residents were ordered back into a six-week lockdown beginning midnight tonight as community transmissions spiked. 134 infections were detected in the past 24 hours. It's a major increase in Australia, which has otherwise been successful in containing COVID-19. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said today Australia will likely slow down the return of its citizens from abroad. And a new national security office was officially opened in Hong Kong, placing mainland Chinese agents in the heart of the territory for the first time. The office is one element of a sweeping new law that has caused alarm in Hong Kong and criticism from other countries, while officials say it will restore stability after violent protests. Chief Executive Carrie Lam said yesterday that it was actually relatively mild as far as national security laws are concerned. To inspire and uplift readers in this new COVID-19 reality, The Straits Times commissioned 30 works by local writers and artists. This was done with the support of the National Arts Council as part of the SG Culture Anywhere campaign. Today we feature ceramic artist Stephen Lowe, who's created a set of clay globes in the style of his Planet series. Have a look. Stephen's Planet series uses Ovara firing, a technique that originated in Eastern Europe in the 12th century, where clay objects are fired and dipped into a fermented liquid made with water, flour, yeast and sugar. 
We are pleased to be joined by none other than the artist behind the beautiful creations, Stephen Lowe. Welcome, Stephen. Now, for a start, could you tell us more about how the uh, Planet series came about? Hi. Hi, today I would like to share with you about the Planet series. So the whole inspiration of my artwork actually comes from the suffering. Ultimate difference between the humans and the universes. Mm. I have a strong interest in the power of the universe and in the finite space. And I took this inspiration to create a series of planet series with the development of science and technology. We are now living in an urban jungle like a society which is very convenient for all the aspects of material conditions, but since slowly dilute the most innocent spirit in ourselves. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for taking the time to speak with us. We've been speaking to ceramic artist Stephen Lo. You can see the other works in the 30 Days of Art with NAC series at this Straits Times website. Two more days to polling day and throughout this election period, our colleagues at the Straits Times have prepared special features. That's right, and they include summaries of key battlegrounds as well as this series where we ask five questions to the leaders of Singapore's four biggest political parties. You can trust the PAP. We've been governing Singapore for more than 60 years. We've never let you down. You can trust the current PAP leadership. For 15 years, I've been PM. I've done my best to serve you. In the last term, you gave us a strong mandate and we have delivered on that. Vote for uh, the Workers' Party because we represent a constructive opposition in Parliament. We are here not to... We don't see the PAP as the enemy. What we are looking for is beyond the PAP, uh, beyond the horizon. We want a Singapore where there are good outcomes for Singapore and Singaporeans. There is this question of accountability, question of, of, uh, of uh, transparency, and also question of independence or appointments of leaders of our country, especially in the civil service. I stand very strongly by this, these three fundamental principles. You know, we've been campaigning on this for yes, one no. Uh, the first yes is to suspend the GST for a year and a half. We've collected, we collect about $10 billion in GST annually, right? To suspend it just temporarily for a year, I think that's very doable. On polling day this Friday, tune in for a special GE 2020 show from 7.45 p.m. We'll be joined by editors Warren Fernandez, Sumiko Tan, Zakia Hussein, Royston Sim and Jeremy Aoyong. Plus, we'll have all the action from the ground, analysis and of course, the official results. Thanks for joining us on The Big Story. I'm Dylan Ang with Olivia Kuei. We'll see you on Friday night.